Thank you all for your um, iron discipline and your steadfastness and uh, now being here for the last panel of the day. Um, this is our plenary number three and it's the Art of Revolution one. So as you recall from this morning, we have three panels, um, one each day, that are focused along, around the thematic of art and revolution, and these panels were in part put together by Gal and Oksana um, with support, um, currently support from um, Humboldt. And we will begin. Um, to, we'll begin with Keti Chukrov um, from the. Uh, higher School of Economics. Yes, Higher, higher School of <laughs> Economics. And her um, paper is Who Makes Revolution in the Age of Speculative Design? Uh, thank you. I was very much impressed by the historical panel, and I cannot um, dare to um, somehow match. Uh, this historical knowledge, but what I will endeavor to do will be some kind of um, exercise in logical speculation on the on the issue of uh, of the proletariat as subject and the issue of knowledge. Um, uh, uh, actually, I, I I will start from a, um, from, from an example. I have recently was watching the Congress of Comintern uh, in 1920, and an amazing thing that struck me was that all those brilliant uh, communist proponents of proletarian revolution, Lenin, Trotsky, Radek, Zinoviev, belonged to middle class, to intelligentsia, to enlightened bourgeoisie. Except and, for Stalin. Yes, there were exceptions. Uh, nonetheless, they initiated constructing uh, the universal subject of proletariat, becoming the avant-garde of after-revolutionary dictatorship. And um, this is the stance that would be unimaginable today, um, that a middle-class leftist cultural workers, despite their militant discourse on behalf of the unprivileged, construct social continuity with this most disadvantaged and most weakest layer of society. Um, establishing it as uh, the most empowered agent of uh, emancipation. So why was it possible then and not possible now? Uh, should we ascribe it uh, to historical moment? Is it about grassroots movements like now and a possibility then? So what is, what is this subject? Uh, is it just organized working class or the concept that exceeds merely social emancipation. Uh, and uh, what is interesting that when we uh, shift to certain theories that are trying to dispense with politics and dispense with uh, political struggle, calling it folk politics, uh, dispensing with the term revolution, which we have so often in xenofeminism, accelerationism, ANT futurologies, the main thing there is um, to get rid of um, uh, the um, uh, political struggle in favor of recreating software of uh, cognitive practices, somehow to uh, super supersede and converge sociality with technoscience, because technoscience is claimed uh, as the agency to uh, achieve those results that politics um, never achieved. And, and we know uh, in, in the recent years, uh, quite a number of, of these theories about post-capitalism and um, trans-revolutionary transformation, but all those um, uh, um, futurologist uh, horizons somehow collapsed uh, after um, certain cases, Brexit, uh, U US elections, and many others. Uh, so what is the uh, uh, what is important uh, uh, that it's not the case of um, dispensing with technology in uh, achievement of uh, a political aim, but what is lacking mainly uh, in the, uh, those transformative uh, techno scientific uh, practices is the issue of common good. 
uh, common virtue, which is unheeded. So um, then, involuntarily, cognitive and social advancement is ascribed to one social layer, which is uh, enlightened intelligentsia, becoming a sole political subject, uh, by the token of its intellectual legibility. How to generate the tie and the bone with, uh, the, with the illegible and construct some kind of coherent um, uh, progressive um, continuity uh, is, is not clear uh, in these uh, practices. And hence, uh, we get uh, the split uh, in lexicons, the rupture between knowledge and ignorance, the rupture in the lexicons uh, of emancipation that divides society into socially progressive and obscurant brainwashed masses. And um, um, uh, uh, I would say that knowledge is, is definitely the stumbling uh, block uh, nowadays uh, because um, uh, those who speak these languages, th those who speak the languages of emancipation are not the most oppressed. And those who are most oppressed do not speak these languages. This is the main uh, paradox and um, incompatibility. Uh, then uh, knowledge and general intellect gradually became in the conditions of semi-capital the main property and means of production and wealth so that it is rather inequality in knowledge that causes insult and resentment in unprivileged layers of society than any ownership of any concrete material goods. Um, and uh, um, uh, this incompatibility uh, brings us uh, to the notion of proletariat. Uh, as we remember, one of the primary demands of October Revolution was a, a total and even coercive equalization and equality of knowledge and education, uh, but even, even more. Uh, so proletariat as class, um, it is not only the class of deprivation and uh, not only the class that surpasses its, its own deprivation, but the class that is surpasses uh, onto ethically the universal, um, claims the universal withering uh, away of any deprivation overall. So, um, uh, this is the class that acquires universality of consciousness. Actually, a proletarian is a supreme philosophic subject. That's why it could become uh, such, a, uh, such a universal term uh, to be able to, to comprise all, uh, all the social divergences. Uh, 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 and uh, um, that's why we have something fantastic in this notion. The subject of deprivation is the principal subject of enlightenment, mind and knowledge, embodying the most developed stage of consciousness and mind, even ahead of any nominal grip of edification, even ahead this subject has any productive forces guaranteeing such developed stage. And what facilitates this premature aheadedness for proletariat to have this condition ahead of time is, of course, revolution. Uh, this is the reason why the avant-garde of revolutionaries, which by origin might have been even uh, part of bourgeoisie, were departing not merely from uh, uh, defending the interests of the oppressed, uh, or pretending to be precarious themselves, but um, they were positing the conflation of the oppressed with the supreme subject of enlightenment in this notion of proletariat. And if, you, uh, if we refer to Lukács' history on class uh, consciousness, we see that he absolutely articulately claims that proletariat's class consciousness is in fact the production of what consciousness has to be per se, Otherwise, bourgeois consciousness is not yet any consciousness at all in its full sense. And uh, interestingly, the same logical argument belongs to Andrei Platonov, who in his artistic, more poetic text says, I quote, the soul of the bourgeoisie is desire and uh, sexuality, and the soul of proletariat is consciousness. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this uh, allows us to shift to a short passage in Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, 
where he mentions how master-servant dialectics is sublate, sublated and it, what is the subjectivity to sublate these dialectics and he claims that it is stoicism. And I will just, uh, I'm quite ashamed because next to me sits the, the most important connoisseur of Hegel, um, uh, but still I will uh, attempt it. Um, so just to remind very shortly, uh, so, uh, uh, w what is w what is this um, uh, kernel um, of this um, uh, interrelation? Uh, master is free from actual uh, existence. That's why his consciousness is independent. The servant is submerged in producing, forming things. It's submerged. Uh, he is submerged into labor. That's why the servant's consciousness is reified. Uh, but the problem with the master is that. He has long longing for the object world. He needs to consume, but his consumption cannot take place without this mediation of the servant, mediation with the reality. Uh, so he cannot get access to things without labor of the servant. That's why um, uh, uh, Hegel says that his consciousness is not truly independent. What, but what is even more amazing and very important is that uh, if uh, in the beginning Hegel claims uh, and makes this allegation that consciousness for its formation and for its generality needs to be abstract, he alleges this as abstraction to then overturn further his own allegation, claiming that it is impossible to acquire consciousness in complete detachment from material world, uh, because labor is essential, as he shows in acquisition of consciousness. Formation of things has the potentiality to become bildung. Formation of things as labor has the potentiality to become knowledge. And hence, the servile um, labor of servant has the potentiality of consciousness. But in this dialectics, uh, neither master nor uh, servant are able to produce truly um, full-fledged consciousness. And the only possibility for that happens when uh, the servant is dispensed with, when uh, um, the new subjectivity, the stoic, uh, comes and sublates the split uh, between body and mind, uh, um, uh, or tries to sublate uh, this split between body and mind, be be between abstraction of thought and submergence into things. But um, um, but uh, yes, Hegel claims that yes, this is truly free consciousness capable of thought, producing uh, uh, thinking uh, out of labor, becoming bildung, uh, but nevertheless, on the one hand, uh, the Stoic dispenses with the slave, but um, uh, 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 then without the slave, his bond with the objectivity and with the reality is also lost, uh, 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 because the master having this common body with the slave at least had the grip and attachment, certain attachment to, to objectivity. And what Hegel emphasizes um, uh, is that um, that's why um, uh, uh, by the way the concept detaches in Stoicism from objectivity, from multifariousness of things, uh, this thought still loses the contents, it remains abstract. Stoicism doesn't answer the question of the truthful, of the virtuous, uh, of the common good, uh, remaining mere intelligence um, and remaining mere civility. And my point is uh, just to use this uh, subjectivity of the Stoic as, the, uh, as this metaphor for um, for uh, intellectual or um, enlightened uh, civility, which, uh, which is doing what? It is dispensing with the uh, subjugated labor because uh, the subjectivity is free, educated, enlightened, and all serving laborers are declared to, to be free, independent citizens. They are freely exchanging their labor on equal terms. Um, but the question is... Um, uh, whether this civility is is truly sublating the the, the superiority inferiority, uh, because uh, we know that uh, 
actually uh, this type of subjectivity is the birth of bourgeois consciousness which is biased, biased by juridical um, uh, equality. Nevertheless, this juridical equality disguises uh, extremities of superiority and <coughs> inferiority. And then uh, we have to still remind ourselves what, um, uh, what uh, uh, allows uh, this former master and former slave not to clash, not to produce again this new sadomasochistic bond of master-slave. And Gerald was mentioning today care. Yes, care is exactly this um, struggle against the falsity and hypocrisy of civility. But on the other hand, what is care? Um, uh, it is quite dangerous because um, exactly because uh, this servant or former inferior is redundant for the enlightened. This former inferior is searching for care, is searching for love, is searching for some kind of heterotopic trans institutes where he can get uh, political unity and political unification. Uh, and my claim is that this redundant former servant is uh, uh, coming to church, is going to, is, is self-employing back uh, to form uh, this non-formal or informal body uh, with the uh, master. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, uh, in, certain, in certain sense, false civility is, is making the subject of ignorance uh, uh, a surplus, redundant, which explains why the present rupture in populist politics is not between the most wealthy and most impoverished, but between the enlightened transnational middle class and uh, obscurant local masses. And what we see is very interesting that authoritarian governments are actually manipulating uh, between these two uh, artificially constructed enemies because they are setting the rage of the masses not on the wealth and trying to deprive uh, themselves from this rage, but they direct the rage exactly on enlightened stoic, on enlightened um, civility of the stoic, uh, presenting them as global rulers who despise the rebel. And um, uh, this brings us um, back to universal subject of consciousness, which is uh, a proletariat and which is able to uh, connect abstraction of thought and concreteness of formation of things, which can um, somehow uh, uh, glue uh, the split and the rupture between uh, body and mind uh, uh, to acquire the consciousness that is both general and speculative and enlightening, but as well concrete in the application of this generality within density of existence. Uh, 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 thus, the Comintern revolutionaries consolidating with proletariat were those post-Stoics who voluntarily dismissed their cognitive hegemony in favor of another more universal consciousness outlined in the subjectivity of the deprived laborer. And as I mentioned, what is fantastic here that this utmost uh, ideational power of mind is given ahead of any uh, educational amplification of this universal consciousness. Uh, ahead of, uh, before this um, uh, uh, edification could be institutionally exerted. Uh, um, uh, let's imagine that someone is claimed as the subject of idea, someone is played philosophic subject before he has acquired the productive or institutional means to confirm this position. Uh, but why is that... Uh, uh, why, why, why again uh, proletariat should be so universal in its consciousness? Um, uh, uh, what makes deprivation so universal? Um, uh, uh, why, uh, how can it be that exactly deprivation can provide this universal subject of intellect? Uh, uh, this fantastic condition when uh, deprivation uh, produces thought and common good and 
um, the, is the kernel of pr 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 production of everything, thought, common good, intellect, knowledge. This is because only proletarian consciousness in its utmost deprivation can be truly reflecting in itself the objectivity of being. So de facto representing the most generalized and socialized uh, mode of, um, of mind. Uh, and therefore happening to be uh, the consciousness per se. And actually, if we map uh, the thought of Marx up to Lukács and Ilyenkov, we see this argument um, in their work. And I would um, uh, finish um, uh, with uh, referring back to a Soviet case, um, uh, which is also a headedness of time, which is a very important case of a headedness of time, um, in establishing the new subject of common good uh, because uh, what we have in Soviet Union is the coercive installment of the political economy of common good um, uh, in the situation uh, when, um, and this is my research which I cannot uh, on which I cannot dwell uh, in detail, but the allegation is that in it, the relations of production were functioning as common good before productive means and technology could fit them. So this headedness of time, like first you have common good and then uh, you might get edification, was uh, somehow the ontoethic construction of um, of this, uh, of this project of communism. And the main thing, the main allegation that I want to make now, and I'm um, really afraid that I will get uh, attacks on, mm -hmm. on me, uh, is uh, uh, this um, uh, paradox of um, a temporality, because, um, um, well, just to repeat, uh, what is the paradox? Uh, um, uh, common good rules political economy and social ethics, as I said, just to confirm, before technology and individual consciousness is ready or edified for it, uh, which means that all material things and humans should immediately materially represent social ideal even before they have instruments and equipment to perform such ideal and even before they have consciousness to need this ideal. Uh, and um, uh, this brings us to, to, uh, to this temporal mm -hmm. trick, because usually the argument is, oh, uh, there was the mantra of communism, there, there, there was the Marxist thought, there, there were communist beliefs, but actually the, uh, the reality was not sufficiently communist, not sufficiently socialist, uh, it was a monopoly capitalism, um, there was not proper dictatorship of proletariat, as Balibar claims uh, in his book. Um, but my allegation is, is converse. Uh, what is made in this temporal headedness and temporal paradox of revolution is that is not the case of insufficient communism, but excessive communism. So you have too much communism immediately as common good, uh, uh, in infrastructure, and then uh, uh, impossibility and inability to fit it. And I would give a theological uh, comparison here. Um, imagine that uh, uh, you, uh, to get into paradise, you, you first have to atone your sins, right? You cannot get into paradise without atoning your sins. But imagine that even without atonement of your sins, you are somehow absolutely materially and bodily placed and uh, situated within paradise. And um, uh, uh, paradise is material, and your body is materially within paradise, but you are a sinner. <laughs> and actually, in early patristics, this was a very important allegation that there is no, no hell. The hell doesn't exist. The hell actually is this paradise in which the sinner exists. So, uh, why it is hell? Oh. Because the sinner wants to sin, but he's in paradise. Mm -hmm. He cannot sin, mm -hmm. and this is hell. <laughs> otherwise, there is no special, <laughs> otherwise, there is no special place for hell. 
so the hell doesn't exist. There is no special uh, location of hell. And I would uh, compare this exactly to, uh, to this communist um, uh, anthropology or, uh, or landscape uh, where you have already the common good, uh, which is um, in a material infrastructure, uh, but uh, uh, you are not uh, fitting it either in edification or uh, in, in your need, the need of your consciousness. So um, uh, this issue that um, the main thing, uh, uh, this is the um, um, critique of Balibar, that the main issue for dictatorship of proletariat would be to go on with class struggle within socialism because socialism as being transitory condition needed more class struggle with capitalism. Um, I would overturn this uh, because this is the allegation for capitalist uh, situation. When you are already uh, you are you are communist, but everything else else the material externality, the social texture, is capitalist. Then you are good, and uh, uh, the surrounding is bad. So you have to resist and just claim that it's 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 good to be in paradise. It's good not to be sinner. But if the reality is otherwise. You are given the totality of paradise, and you are the sinner. Then you have to fit the, um, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, common good. And that's why my <laughs> crazy claim <laughs> is uh, that my crazy claim is that dictatorship of proletariat um, actually means criminalization of deviation from common good uh, and not class struggle. Uh, and it means the struggle with one's own insufficient universality of consciousness and the struggle with one's own insufficient communism. Thank you. So many thanks for the organization of this wonderful event, to be part of this collective past and future awakening. There will be quite maybe some uh, connections with your last last parts between what is actually paradise. Um, so this awakening of theoretical, political, artistic rousing of revolutionary spirit, dear comrades, tovarishi, tovarishice, um, where else than in this place that all started 100 years ago, precisely on the day. Um, I changed the title of the lecture. I was firstly wanting to speak about uh, revolutionary signification, which is one of my topics on, um, I'd say, discovery or of revolutionary sequences or encounters between film and revolution political events. Um, and there I, I spent some time uh, talking or discussing uh, Lenin's formula as well. Uh, communism is electrification plus Soviets. My thesis is to add additional, uh, additional side to it, and that's signification, um, signification, electrification, and Soviets. Um, so when I started thinking how to come back to October, uh, I got stuck in one uh, famous scene of Verto, hu human being with a uh, movie camera or cinema apparatus. It's a very bad translation, uh, not like a man with a movie camera, but Chovyek's uh, kino apparatum. Um, and there is, uh, right after departure of this display of film exhibition, a kind of this circulation in the, uh, uh, in the cinema hall, we have the scene of awakening of women. There you have this awakening into the communist morning city, which in, unfolds in different workers' activities, women as workers, women as sports women, and also the woman the, being the chief editor of the film itself. Within the film history perspective, Yuri Tsivian was quoting that this awakening of the woman is actually some kind of internal filmic quote. So being critical towards a German film from 27 of one uh, uh, film director, Sawa, um, which is basically a melodrama. So that's like within this film history. What I wanted to always push for is a little bit to move beyond this film history perspective um, or just kind of very narrow. And to see the film of Verto in terms of ambitious attempt 
to push Soviet reality towards communism, a little bit like uh, 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 being ignorant of socialism, but wanting to be in communism. So I don't know, these dialectics we, we should discuss maybe in discussion a little bit more. Uh, there is certain visual awakening of Marx's slogan, workers of the world unite. So that's also one of Francierian point of the movie, that there is some kind of equality of movements of rhythmic works of labors that are put on a horizontal uh, axis. So there is no kind of staccano or industrial worker that is on the top of the pyramid of, of the socialist uh, society. But then I would radicalize this point and say that basically there is not, there was not just a space of equality of work, but also equality between work and non-work a kind of reproduction and production. It's like kind of filmic production and reproduction, but there is this kind of double movement into the social production and reproduction. So that's, that's one of more radicalizing points uh, that goes further from Ranciere's uh, suggestion. And secondly, of course, uh, where I come back to this awakening, the key agency is not ascribed to workers as such, but to women emancipation on one side, and by extension to transformation of humanity into machines. So there is this post-human within the communism that hasn't been there the last 15, 20 years, or this digital turn, but already like in 20s in uh, Soviet Union. So this is one kind of central part of Kinooki Manifesto, which comes uh, six years before the film, uh, the quote is, we introduce creative joy into all mechanical labor. We bring people into closer kinship with machines. We foster new people. The new man, woman, free of unwildiness and clumsiness, will have the light, precise movement of machines, and she, he, will be the gratifying subject of our films. The manifesto actual film professed the awakening of camera eye, and more than about present spoke about imagined future, which makes human with a movie camera some kind of filmic variation of monument to the third international, kind of that linear, which you all, uh, okay, this is still from the, still from the uh, man with the movie camera, a kind of projection how, how, how that would look. Um, and kind of to, to use the Deleuzean uh, dictum, uh, when he speaks about the monument to revolution, it is about the echoes, vibrations, and visions, I add, of October in the future, which instills these bonds between the people and performs some kind of Benjamin and technique of awakening through remembrance. Perhaps this monument to revolution is more interesting, a bit less famous, uh, because it was temporary. Right? In 1918, just a year after, on the first anniversary of the revolution, not 100, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, let's say, a street intervention uh, uh, by, by Nikolai um, Koloso. Um, it's basically what they say, uh, key inspiration also for Elisitsky a few years later, kind of, this was red. Right and the white, uh, so kind of, uh, and the civil war was still, of course, very much going on. So Verto's film manifesto, there is some kind of basis or a strong belief and dream that the future will necessarily turn red. I think that Susan Buck Morse did an excellent work to put that progressist necessity into the brackets and show also how the avant-garde dream world of utopia of 20s woke up in the Stalinist nightmares of 1930s. But for Susan Bachmore's political awakening is more than just a disenchantment that the dream was just a dream. Rather, I quote, political awakening requires the rescue of the collective desires to which the socialist dream gave expression before they sink into the unconscious as forgotten. This rescue is the task of the dream's interpretation. Okay, and then you have psychoanalysis, which I won't go now. <laughs> One could add that the nightmare continues in the real life after 1989, since we seem to wake up into the Tina, there is no alternative, where it's not even allowed to dream about any other possible alternative. This quandary or blockage made me think again about the dialectics of dreaming and awakening, especially about awakening, and this kind of lecture will be a small contribution to present awakening beyond the mere visual metaphor or kind of this socialist enlightenment that we see the bulb 
of Lenin uh, on this image, electrifying signification. Rather, I suggest to read it as a technique political mechanism. In order to do this, I will have to go really way back, but it's a kind of temporality of eternity. <laughs> uh, so to kind of to revisit a biblical figure, Lazarus, or not Sylvan Lazarus, I wasn't <laughs> talking about, or Neil Lazarus, the post-colonial theorist, but really to go to the uh, Bible. I don't know, do we need to really go so much back to distantiate ourselves so much to go so way back to the history to talk about the October Revolution. But I, yeah, I hope I can, I can give certain contribution to, let's call it this Marxian neo-eschatology, um, and to point certain role that Lazarus uh, played in Marx, Fanon, Lenin, and briefly Foucault. Accelerate. Like now I really accelerate. Lazarus, it's a small disclaimer. I come from uh, socialist Yugoslavia, from a very anti-socialist background. So I don't have any like expert knowledge or in the reading of religious text, you have to, uh, um, I have to apologize in advance if I made some big, big mistake. This is in a very rudimentary form because I started reading it a few weeks ago. So the topic of awakening, as you know well, has a strong religious history and was often overwritten by the central topic, resurrection, last day, apocalypse, and so on. Obvious references to resurrection in the context of post-October could be found in cosmism, God-building, mobilization of learning, fighting the death. Okay. In certain respect, post-1989, also there was a strong reading performed even in the title of this, uh, uh, of this conference, so Derrida, a kind of resurrection, spectrality, certain survie of Marx that remained inscribed to this trope of resurrection, which strongly defined 1990s readings on Marx. I will not enter here into the, its shortcomings, like uh, uh, um, failing to address the, 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 the difference between specter and spirit. If Marx speaks about spirit, it's really Hegelian spirit. So here he's much uh, more invested into that. Um, also not about failing to provide some kind of clear political alternative, the rediving. Uh, for me, more interesting developments in the last decades were the publication of this area of pre impressive uh, books uh, this returns to, let's say, kind of uh, Jewish, Walter Benjamin, Christian, Islamic tradition. There is Agamben's, uh, Lorenzo Sakeza was working <laughs> on interesting excavation of kind of what the homo sacer and the uh, uh, religious politics within that would be. Negri's postulation of uh, deprivation or poverty and Franciscans. Then you have Badiou and Zizek's defense of St. Paul. It's, it's important against the liberal ideological attitude, even of some of early Marx, uh, maybe that posits a religion as ignorance of masses. Although Marx never said this is like opium for people, but opium of people. So there is a small uh, um, important difference uh, between those. And these readings kind of enter into the enemies terrain or kind of point out certain emancipatory kernels within these religious traditions that link to the oppressed, to the tradition of the past and future oppressed. However, reading those texts, I was struck by one symptomatic absence, the figure of Lazarus. Surely we cannot speak of his absence in churchly writings and preachings in the warrior's literary poetic painterly expressions, as we know, in the Renaissance, this was a very strong uh, 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 kind of uh, expression, or like a topic. As it goes for any major figure, also Lazarus has been a site of diverse conflicts appropriations. Awakening of Lazarus is the biggest miracle and as a strong mm. sign of God, but does it resurrect the flesh or only soul? It's like a big interpretations on that. I'm not interested if and where his real grave is, although there are a couple of them, uh, how and where he lived, both Orthodox Catholic Church in Barak Lazarus on, sh on the ship either to Marseille or Cyprus. What I'm more interested in is that figure of Lazarus is already in the Bible split into two. We can find Lazarus in John's Gospel. John's Gospel has, as we know, a very special stat status as it claims to be the only real eyewitness by a disciple whom Jesus loved. And then we have a second Lazarus from Luke's Gospel. 
Some interpretations speculate that this Lazarus is the same person, one seen as a beggar, second time as a sick leper, which later, later also led to this mixing of festivities celebrations. Lazarus, as etymology says it, is the one that the God has helped. Let me go first to Lazarus of Luke. We know of the, this parable of the rich man who feasts it's like I found one, uh, one maybe uh, just uh, painting uh, from this uh, story. So we know that this rich man feasts and eats big, uh, excessive communist dinners. No communists for the rich, uh, communism for capitalists. Uh, while on the others in the Trump Tower, while the beggar Lazarus is not allowed to enter the tower and stays at the gates in the ghettos. The parable suggests that the beggar did not even get the cramps since the wounds soar and are licked by the dogs who are his immediate competition. Rich and poor are separated by the gates. Later, beggar dies and, as we know, he's not buried. While the rich man eventually dies and is buried. We know about the status of Burial and... Uh, uh, Burial? Burial? How is that? Burial. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Once you bury somebody, uh, burial, yeah. So basically, we know what does that mean about the sinful and kind of this kind of life excommunication. Um, but this is not the end of the story, as they almost meet, not really, through God, uh, in the abode of the dead. A very classical reversal of the roles takes place. Lazarus finds himself in a pleasantly queer place, Abraham's bosom. While the rich man is in the lake of fire, thirsty and in big for torment. Bakhtin suggested that this parable is a typical form of Menipea, which tests by means of temptation and is marked by this carnivalesque reversal. Those crowned in life will be then decrowned in afterlife, and the poor will be rich, and so on. You know it. However, this Bakhtinian trope ends up in a humanist liberal interpretation. It falls short to register a central aspect of the parable. Remember, Richman tries first to establish some kind of communicative public sphere with Abraham and Lazarus. Firstly, he asked for a tip of the finger to be put in the water and then because he's so thirsty. And secondly, he has got a favor to send a messenger of repentance. Uh, is it loud enough or I should speak here? It's fine. Okay, good. So this is just fake. It was fake. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we, have, we have these two things. Communication with the, with the, with the messenger, basically sending the messenger to the relatives of, of, of the rich man to warn them that they should live according to prophets and the Moses. Of course, the God doesn't have mercy, and he actually proclaims a very Marxist uh, uh, maxim here. Lord says, a great chasm rift has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you Lazarus may not be able and none may cross from here to us. There is no encounter, no reconciliation that will take place. The class rift struggle is too mm. strong. Also, this helps us understand why March bourgeois revolution had to be followed by October. Then we have the second, more significant Lazarus of John's gospel, the one that is awakened to life. Remember, Mary, Mary and Martha they call upon Jesus, who is at that time very far away. Uh, this is Caravaggio. This is the second uh, Lazarus. And uh, so they call him so to, to tell that Lazarus, the sick brother, is uh, dying, the one that Jesus loves. We witness a bizarre dialogue a sort of perplexity where disciples arg argues that Lazarus is dead, while Jesus insists he's only asleep. Jesus then decides, despite disciple warnings, to put it like this. Uh, <laughs> Jesus is with us. Mm. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, the, um, basically, to return back to Bethany, but it was quite dangerous. It seems. 
it was too late or in vain. Lazarus is dead already four days. And after seeing how sad his sisters are, and as they seem to be critical of Jesus' belated arrival, Jesus cries, Jesus wept. And this is the only reference for Jesus to cry over a specific person in the whole Bible. Second one is crying because of Jerusalem when he goes there before he enters as a king. Jesus announces a bit angrily, stubbornly, as he has some kind of small or senses, small disappointment in sorrow of sisters and perplexity of his disciples. How could Lord forsaken the one that he loved, Lazarus, as the name says, the one that needs God's help? Despite the terrible smell, three days after opening the tomb, the tomb is opened. Jesus has God to listen, to give him strength while he calls to death Lazarus to come forth and awaken. Nota bene, only once in the whole Bible an active verb for waking him up is used in the original Greek. It is the word ex upniso and is directly attributed to the word of Lord. I owe this uh, linguistic footnote to uh, Martin Domin uh, Dominique, who is also sitting in this room, so thank you for this. Um, ex upniso means actively bringing somebody out of the state of slumber, to rise, them, to rise them out of that state into another. Functions as performative. Jesus' action then draws, extricates Lazarus of the passive state, be dead or sleep. This performative uterine speech act bears a strong resemblance with Althusser's ideological interpolation, where awakening of the individual into subject requires an agent or rather apparatus. In case of Jesus, there was no existing Christian church apparatus, but a small community on the move in resistance. His hailing of the dead, or saying hello to the dead, rise up, functioned rather as a leap of faith, as something what we could call a counter-interpolation. -inter against all the nature and the existing church morals. Now the effects of this awakening were even more important. First, the not so important. Lazarus as the subject of miracle, on which the miracle was performed, is not as important as Altisarian frame wishes for. Even more, we only see him once more at the dinner. He seems mute, quite ind indifferent, maybe even angry on the god that he woke him up again, and maybe he's sick again, being a subject of give grace, love of God. While more importantly, we can see Lazarus as a paradigmatic figure onto which Jesus' own awakening will take place a few days later. Thus, it is correct to stress that this act was directed especially to the disciples, disciples and his close circle of followers, also Mary, who was the first who saw the Jesus awakening so on, this is another issue. So all will be prepared for Jesus' own death and resurrection for passion. While I would also add that this act was directed to all sick and poor of Bethany. Surely even miraculous interpolation does not work with 100% success rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those that belong to the old order started to conspire <laughs> even more strongly towards the Jesus and plan to kill Lazarus the second time. <laughs> And in the great novel, Last Temptation of Christ, and also film that was done uh, later on, there is actually <coughs> one of the only instances where the second death of Lazarus is medi meditated mm. and is ascribed to St. Paul. Mm. One last important point to stress is that both stories of Lazarus number one and two share specific space of political ex exclusion. Gates, in the case of first Lazarus, in front of the ridge, this reef that I was talking, Bethany, house of poor, ghetto, in front of Jerusalem, in the second Lazarus. The space of Bethany was reserved for the poor sick leper prostitutes, where sinners lived and travelers could stay without being bothered, but still it was a space of excommunication outside of Jerusalem. One could see awakening as a potential trigger for the uprising precisely of those six sinners and poor in spaces of immiseration. Potential uprising that Jesus then later kind of performs in the temple. A small Foucauldian note, 
The excluded spaces for lepers bore the name of Lazarus through the Middle Ages up until today. Saint Lazar, Lazarus is a patron of lepers. And as you know, in the Crusades, this was the very uh, mighty uh, knight order um, that had a network of hospitals on one side and also like commerce and was a strong military forms. It comes as no surprise that Foucault's first coming out in 1960-61 in his Madness and Civilization departs with the ship of fools, a strong visual metaphor that presents madness and folly, fears of society, more deeply it presents the traditional order of sovereignty, where all the lepers mad really sick were to be segregated, so to the colonies outside of the cities. Interestingly also, and a very anti-Christian gesture by the Christian society then, they were to perform a ritual to become dead. They were participating in those rituals where they were excommunicated from the cities. So, like, contrary to kind of Jesus' lesson that kind of alleviates or awakens them from the dead, the society kind of uh, returned the answer to, to Jesus. Simultaneously, first major pogroms that was happening in Europe, both were targeting Jews and lepers and seen as a conspiracy of Muslims in Spain. These racial riots came from below and from above. So leper colonies could be seen almost as ghettos, a long history of European dealing with other. On the one hand, there was disgust, fear of spreading diseases, while on the other hand, there is a certain aid of leper as a sign of God that works on, on the sins of the leper, right? And as if the guardians of the Lazarus Knight Order, rather than healing of lepers, they were more occupied with not letting out, not letting to spread out a revolutionary spirit, the awakening of those sick poor beggars. Number three, Marx. Marx's introduction to Lazarus, I'm sorry, I'm going like really fast because I have just five more minutes. Um, Marx takes only a standpoint of capital when he speaks about uh, Lazarus, when he speaks about surplus population. Uh, we shall find just one, only one quote in the whole Marx over. Okay, this is the uh, Bosch uh, ship of fools. This is the Venice uh, leper colony. It's not so interesting. The more interesting, important Karl Marx. Uh, <laughs> Basically, as Gavin Walker highlighted in talk a few years ago, this reference is to be found at the end of Capital, Volume 1, where Marx discusses crisis and the law of capitalist accumulation, which will necessarily lead to pauperism and miseration, while the body that is composed in the process is the mass of industrial reserve army, which increases with the potential energy of wealth. Surplus population are Lazarini. To quote Marx, more extensive finally the Lazarus layers of the working class and industrial reserve army, the greater is official pauperism. Since Marx speaks from the standpoint of capital, surplus population is faux frais, wrong collateral costs of production. What's more? Hmm? Say it one more Say time. Again. Uh, it's basically when you when you talk uh, from the standpoint of capital, surplus population is faux frais, so kind of uh, collateral costs or uh, wrong costs uh, of of the product capitalist production. And to quote again, as you have the last one here, pauperism is the hospital Lazarus of the active labor army and the dead weight of the industrial reserve army. Oh. The case, industrial reserve army. Reserve means that the army of the dead can be resurrected by vampire capital when necessary, and in the meantime, it performs a constant pressure on the level of wages of real existing labor power. So part of the creation of relative surplus value. When we talk about the surplus population, we have to link it or how it is connected to the relative surplus value. What Marx forgets to mention here, but does a bit later, is that contrary to the myth that capitalism works on a purely economic kind of constraint, the originary accumulation of capital, which is perpetuated, cannot be understood without legal political constraint that actually pushed vegabonds, beggars, Lazarus number one, into the manufacturers to work. To add in the situation of war, the reserve army 
of beggars, lepers, and so on. Lepers, it would be quite a zombie army. Mm. Uh, mm. Easily became army of empire, national state, which conscripted, hired mercenaries, organized professional private army, however you want it also in today's time. In terms of proletarian composition, Marx remained highly critical of surplus and rather say that surplus population was counter-revolutionary subject. Mm. As in the 18th Primaire. Uh, yeah, or for example, Taipei uh, revolts, which he says, I understand that they're so brutal because of a colonial exploitation, domination, but it's still there is no political articulation. But he forgets that every big and successful revolution from the French Revolution onwards, or Haiti, or October Revolution, and also anti-colonial, had the dimension of surplus, of riots. They were the ones that actually started those revolutions. So that's, that's kind of the political lesson of this that goes against these economist uh, claims, where it will happen first, uh, by which subject, who is the avant-garde, and so on. So this is important point, a small critique of Marx. The other one, uh, very fast, two more minutes. Uh, oh, it's not Lenin, actually. I, I thought I have also, okay, I didn't put inside. Fanon. Um, I will just read very fast, important quote, b because he's important to understand certain anti-colonial moment or kind of, you know, development of October Revolution later on. Mm. So what he says, this man or woman, Lumpen in colonial, but also we could speak of post-colonial condition, want to be allowed to be inside the cities. This mass of humanity will spearhead the new rebellions, Fanon suggests. To quote, uprooted from their tribe and from their clan, they constitute one of the most spontaneous and the most radically revolutionary forces of a colonized people. Its forces endanger the security of the town, while workless less than men are rehabilitated in their own eyes and in the eyes of history. They will, once more, go forward, march proudly in the great procession of the awakened nation. For Fanon, Lumpen were the avant-garde within the revolutionary anti-colonial struggle, while their dreams are muscular dreams, dreams of action, dreams of aggressive vitality against the colonizers. And to conclude in 15 seconds and one more minute with Lenin, the dreaming and political awakening was not at all foreign to Lenin. Stodelat, what is to be done, as one of the most important pieces that also Lars Lee very well interpreted um, Rather than seeing Lenin as a theorist or pragmatist, he sees it as a revolutionary preacher. You know? This can be evidenced by two points, by the Old Testament, New Testament, I won't go into this, um, but accelerated by the belief that revolutionary leader is not the one that teaches, leads the passive masses, instill the consciousness from without. Rather, I would claim Lenin should be seen as a reader of the masses. The major crux of this reading finds its source in the surprising passages that are also quoted here, where revolutionary leaders' organization should learn from the masses in time when millions and millions of the working class spontaneously rises up for the struggle. Furthermore, and this is where it has to answer the call, from the spontaneously awakening masses and the leaders' boiling energy is taken up, taken up and supported by the energy of revolutionary class. So the task is recognition of the, of the awakening and so on. And this is just to finish it up. This basically 1902, Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg are speaking about the strike in Rostov and Don in the region of Russia. It's the first coming out awakening of, of the right of assembly and kind of weeks of big strikes that prepare 1905, the defeat, the revolution that was defeated. But it is basically something that kind of informed politically, theoretically, Lenin Rosa Luxemburg. Thank you. Thank you very much. My talk has gone in a very different direction than I, I thought it would when I tossed off that title. Um, and it may be a little bit, uh, may be a little bit more abstract than I would have wanted it to be, but I hope it, I hope it resonates. Can you speak up? Yes. Uh, can I, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Okay. Now? You speak. Yeah. I am, aren't I? 
much closer. So if it didn't sound so pompous and so cloyingly literary, I would venture to say that there's nothing more tragic than a failed revolution. I cringed and then I yawned, and then I cringed a little bit more as soon as I wrote those words, because this is, of course, the standard liberal consensus. From Arendt onwards, tragedy has always been the favored trope of liberal historiography of revolution. The pathos of the liberal, this liberal mantra is matched only by the elegiac tone of left-wing melancholia, liberalism's secret ally. The first scenario rehearses the endless litany of failure, the pathos of finitude, the hubris of overreaching, the madness of reason, the inexorable reversals of destiny, the crashing of the loftiest ideals into the brutal realities of their execution. The second scenario rehearses the endless litany of defeat. The beautiful charisma of the losers is exceeded only by the even more beautiful anguished, but more beautiful anguish of the disappointed onlookers who discover their own heroism in tenacity of their intransigent fidelity to the lost cause. Both scenarios dehistoricize in equal measure. The first scenario folds event into structure. The revolution is inscribed within the wheel of fortune, within the balefulness of human nature. The second scenario folds structure into event. The, maroon, the revolution is marooned from history while its spectators enjoy forever circling around the trauma of the missed moment. In both scenarios, the construction of tragedy, even the naming of the tragedy as tragedy, has an immediately purgative and sanitizing effect. A calming of the passions, a <coughs> clarification of reason, a cleansing, one might also say a dampening of the political imagination. Both scenarios produce the comforts of spectatorial immunity. One hand washes the other, the table is set, the funeral meats are served up as wedding feast. The suffering of the revolution becomes food for culinary consumption. These are the faux tragic modalities. Both scenarios evacuate what is most tragic about revolution and also occlude the revolutionary kernel of the tragic, the dialectical power of its collisions, the clarities, the reversals, catastrophes, counterfinalities, the irredeemable errors, misfirings, missings, the mark, the misjudgments, the bad timings or mistimings, the belated anagnoresis or recognition, the unending work of purification. The work is like housework unending, simply because every purification leaves in its wake another mess to clean up, and so on. The forced or self-defeating <coughs> reconciliations, the persistent irreconcilabilities, the grinding and ever-shifting antinomies between freedom and necessity, individual and collective, contingency and necessity, agency and coercion. Last but not least, both of these tragic scenarios tranquilize the sorrow that they evoke. Despite their display of sadness, both scenarios are actually not sad enough, or they're sad in the wrong way, or at the wrong time, or something like this. Their function is to set strict limits to the pathos they dish out. The suffering of the revolution is therefore quarantined it is rendered literally inconsequential, without precedent or aftermath. We lament the revolution's failure and forget about the suffering that necessitated the revolution in the first place and from the global suffering that keeps on spooling in the aftermath of its abortion. Fixated on the trauma of the revolution, we forget that the catastrophe is ongoing. Or rather, as Benjamin reminds us, the catastrophe lies precisely in the fact that everything keeps on going. The catastrophe is the ongoingness of the ongoing. This is why we must reclaim this, the moribund category of the tragic. If tragedy, like revolution itself, seems to be irretrievably fusty and outdated, the point is not to resurrect it, or to declare its abiding relevance as a genre, how could we, after Brecht, after Beckett, after Benjamin, after Nietzsche, 
but to redeem it precisely in its moribundness. This is what Benjamin means when he speaks of detonating the revolutionary potentials of the outmoded. So far, I've been going along more or less with Aristotle's definitions, but with one significant caveat. Aristotle famously contrasts poetry and history. He privileges the former on modal grounds. Whereas history deals only with brute facts or positivities, things that merely happen to have occurred, poetry deals with possibilities, things that might occur, which also means that they might not occur or that despite their possibility or probability they fail to do so that the possibility might remain forever unrealized. This is why Aristotle thinks that poetry is more philosophical, he says, than historiography. It paints on a bigger canvas. It raises the merely existent to its properly conceptual significance. It pushes the particular towards the horizon of intelligibility. Revolution forces us to recognize that history, too, has its poetry. They teach us, it teaches us that possibility is a properly historical and not a narrowly literary or aesthetic modality. History is the domain of possibility and not simply the domain of facticity, precisely because it is an artifact or a result or product <coughs> of poiesis rather than a natural occurrence. Revolution is the counter fetishistic event that explodes the mythic immediacy of a history that has congealed into second nature. It reveals history to be an archive of possibilities rather than a storehouse of accomplished facts. In exposing history to its own latency, its own potentiality, revolution is in this sense the very model of mediated immediacy. The tragic twist is that possibility reveals itself in the first instance in the moment of its lapsing or passing. Only in its counterfactual ruination does possibility render its most extreme historicity and thus history present its own potentiality. This is a somewhat abstractly Hegelian way of saying that history has its tragic side. Revolutions bring this tragedy into full view, into focus. Men, I'm quoting, sorry, men make their own history, but not simply as they please. Every action is blindsided by the opacity of circumstances, every initiative hindered by the debris of past initiatives, every dream haunted by the nightmares of dead generations. History as such is in this sense a nightmare from which we try, perhaps in vain, to awaken ourselves, to awaken mm. others. Mm. A revolution brings this burden and this blindness into explicit focus. A re revolution is dramatic, not simply because the stakes are so high and because everything happens in such a big way, and not simply because it likes or needs to announce itself to advertise itself, although of course for practical organizational reasons it needs to do this. A revolution is inherently dramatic in that it stages the performative convergence of doing and saying. It makes a drama of its own doing. Revolution marks the switching station between history and story, between res gestae and historia rerum gestorum, between historical happening and its narrative implotment or coding. Revolution punctuates history. It marks the nodal point and the modal point where history itself insists, where history as such, as a totality, flashes into view in the singularity of the moment. The revolution does not simply produce artworks. It is an art form in the making. A revolution is never sans phrase. It requires constant phrasing and rephrasing. The performance needs captions. This is why Lenin ends up taking time out in the middle of everything that was happening to write a whole essay on the necessity of slogans, why he keeps writing directives 
on the distinction between correct and incorrect slogans, why he stresses the necessity of the correct wording and the proper timing, why he keeps adjusting slogans, revoking them when their time is up, rewording them as the circumstances dictate. Collective action needs its slogans because it needs its summaries, its directives, its resumes, its titles, its subheadings. It needs to declare itself, to come to the point, to state its point, all power to the Soviets, the conversion of the present imperialist war into a civil war, the United States of Europe, Soviets plus electrification, <laughs> and so on. Insurrection is an art, Lenin writes, and like any art, it needs to produce its own public, which means it most, must both gauge and generate the conditions of its own reception. It has to generate the conditions of its own legibility. Revolutionary action produces its own language, and language is already a form of action. Lenin sees here the essential difference between what he calls vulgar and authentic revolutionism. The former, he writes, fails to see that the word is also a deed. Simultaneously retrospective and prospective, it points forward precisely by pointing backwards. The revolution, and I wanted to stress this temporality of, of the speech act itself, the revolutionary slogan condenses and abridges all history into the crystalline moment of action. It makes history precisely in marking it. This means that there is a porosity not only between the event and its telling, but also between the telling and its retelling. A revolution is an event doubled by its own reenactment. Every storming of the Winter Palace needs its own storming of the Winter Palace, the choreographed performance, the film version. The spectacle needs its own spectacle, and the spectacle produces an essential porosity between actor and spectator. In breaching this fourth wall, the spectacle also exposes a difficult porosity between individual and collective. Revolutionary spectacle explores this porosity while counter-revolutionary spectacle tries to neutralize or tranquilize its revolutionary potency by inducing absorption or empathy. This is also why revolutions demand commemoration in their failure lies precisely their aborted promise. Counter-revolution exploits commemoration by converting the failure into a morality tale or by monumentalizing defeat in the frozen moment of glorious apotheosis. Those are the two prongs I set out at the beginning. This is another parallel between tragedy and revolution, or rather a mark of their speculative conversion. For repetition uh, is the very structure of tragedy itself. Even its most singular turning point is marked by a doubling. Cognition is already recognition, anagornorisis, and knowing again, every finding is a refinding. This is also why tragedy lends itself so easily to comic replication, why, as a genre, it is so easy to parody and ridicule. As always, it is a question of pace and timing. All Aristophanes had to do was to turn on the machine, insert some lines from Euripides Andromeda, and switch the high-speed replay button, and out came the Thesma for Yazuzai. Doesn't matter. That's how it worked, anyway. First time is tragedy, second time is farce. That this is true is nothing short of tragedy. But the logic of this catastrophe must be properly articulated. Tragedy is not only succeeded or superseded by farce. Farce is not just the second act, the dessert that follows the meal. It is already part of the meal. Tragedy does not only lend itself to farce, it is always already on the way to farce, already engaged in its own deflation or self etiolation deterioration, its own self-plagiarism, its re-addition. Behind every nephew 
there's an uncle. But behind every uncle, there is a nephew. Behind every Napoleon III, there is a Napoleon, the real one. But behind every Napoleon, there's a Caesar. But Julius Caesar is only a Caesar because his nephew made him, his own nephew made him so. It is Augustus Caesar who, in founding the empire that Julius Caesar was blocked from doing, turns Julius Caesar into a Caesar in the first place. He bequeaths to Caesar the family name Caesar and thereby turns his ancestor into his own successor. He turns Julius Caesar into Augustus Caesar's own successor. In assuming his uncle's legacy, he generates this legacy and thus becomes the ancestor of his own ancestor. He introduces a crucial torsion or time warp into the testamentary circuit. It is the nephew who names the uncle. Augustus Caesar turns the proper name into a patronym and the name itself into something more than a name. The name becomes a title, an insignia, a trope, a kind, a classification. Thus we can speak of a Caesar, a Kaiser, a Tsar, a kind of salad dressing. Napoleon III mm. becomes the epitome of a Bonaparte. He becomes the retroactive founder of Bonapartism. We're already deep in the territory of the 18th Brumaire. You'll have noticed that I've been sampling from Marx, Marx's text from almost the beginning, sometimes quoting, at times rephrasing, at times silently correcting. I've been wary to take this on. The text itself is weary with overexposure, and so am I. I mean, weary, that is. And it would be a mistake to take this text, or any other text for that matter, as a template for revolutionary failure. There is no script for counter-revolution any more than there's a script for a revolution, although it is very scary, actually, to read the 18th Brumaire right now. A very, very scary thing. Counter-revolutions are just as improvisatory as revolutions, possibly even more so. Is not flexibility, adaptability, gamesmanship part of the arsenal of neoliberalism? Are not slogans the stuff of advertising? I'm out of time, I'm sure. No, you're good. Oh, I want it to be. So I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> We can stop. No, no. With one last observation. <laughs> <laughs> Tragedy of comedy. Marx himself suffered from reminiscences. Nowhere does the pressure of dead generations weigh more nightmarishly than in the 18th Brumaire. Not yet able to pop Hegel on his feet to invert the speculative inversion, Marx instead in this text reverts to incessantly quoting him. From the famous opening lines, the text is a tissue of quotations, rewritings, emendations, citations of citations, because usually the Hegel that Marx quotes is, 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 Hegel's, own, um, is Hegel's own aphoristic use of, of proverbial sayings, translations of translations. Each time Marx quotes Hegel, he either reads what never was written, or in repeating Hegel's words, he entirely rewrites them. Gray on gray, the crepuscular triumph of philosophy turns out to be the spectral condition of historical disaster. Well worked, old mole. The cunning of reason turns out to be the latency of revolution. Hic rotus, hic salta. The formula of accommodation turns out to be the battle cry of insurrection. Marx turns a philosophical homily into something that might be on the way to becoming a revolutionary slogan. But Marx's labor You're good. Okay. <laughs> of quotation does not stop at the level of literal citation. It operates at a more subterranean level, or more systematic, the deep level of grammar and syntax. Here's a passage, a typical one, and probably a familiar one, where Marx describes the comeuppance of a bourgeoisie that has bartered away its political collateral to protect its economic assets. This is the essential argument of the 18th Brumaire, of course. Everything is rebounding and reversing in an accelerating cascade. 
One might say the tragic peripeteia has been emptied of all pathos and significance. The bourgeoisie cannot claim the role of tragic hero and is incapable of grasping the speculative truth of its own undoing. The reversal of fortune is unaccompanied by any insight and for that matter, by any real suffering. Here's the, here's the, the passage. It, the bourgeoisie, deified the sword. Now the sword rules over it. It destroyed the revolutionary press. Now its own press is destroyed. It put public meetings under police surveillance. Now its drawing rooms are spied on by the police. It disbanded the D Democratic National Guard. Now its own Democratic Guard has been disbanded. It imposed a state of siege. Now a state of siege has been imposed on it. It replaced juries with military commissions. Now its juries have been militarized. It put public education under the influence of the church. Now the church subjects it to its own education. It transported people without trial. Now it has been being transported itself without trial. It suppressed every impulse in society through the use of state power. Now every impulse of its society is crushed by state power. The, the cumulative force of this is, is important, which is why I'm um, indulging myself in reading the, this, much of this paragraph. The bourgeoisie never tired of proclaiming to the revolution what Saint Arsenius said to the Christians, fuge, tace, quiesce, run away, be silent, keep still. Bonaparte admonishes the bourgeoisie, run away, be quiet, be still. In its, um, in, in its accelerated repetitiousness, um, we, find, we can read a, a spoof or parody of tragedy, perhaps. But what intrigues me here is how closely this passage mirrors the syntax of dialectic. The 18th Brumaire is often criticized for its bad Hegelianism, for um, being able to produce at zero hour a, a revolution as a kind of deus ex machina to salvage um, what is otherwise presented as an unmitigated disaster. But I want to, I, I, I want to point to something else in, 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 in this writing. Because what this, what this passage, um, this repeats, um, really presents, I think, is a kind of speeded up dialectic, a kind of dialectic on steroids, dialectical mm. machinery at its most unstoppable, running on empty, simultaneously abbreviated, so the, you know, the, the expressions are short and expanded, they just keep on proliferating, at once reduced and inflated. Formulaic in its efficiency, it can keep on amplifying itself interminably. There is something slapstick and even antic in this unstoppability, and I, I always think here when I'm reading this, this text of Charlie Chaplin cranked mm -hmm. up on the assembly line in, in modern times and just can't stop doing it. Um, dialectical antinomy then, rather than speculative supersession. This is not dialectic at a standstill, but dialectical stasis. The standstill as stasis, where history grinds to a halt and the dialectic reduces to a hollowed out formula. This is why Marx speaks of farce <coughs> rather than comedy. Um, this is not only because comedy, no less than tragedy, at least promises, at least promises narrative closure, while farce is infernally open-ended and makes no pretense to be otherwise. As its name suggests, farce, um, farci is the, is the overstuffed genre, like Bonaparte's sausages, that can stretch to contain multitudes. <laughs> Hence, the multiplication of actors on the stage of history, the motley crew that makes its ragtag appearance while the pageantry proliferates, the psychodramas escalate, and the proletariat, meanwhile, is pushed backstage, and the class struggle obscured by the shadow boxing of parliamentarians. But farce is also crucially different than comedy in that the operation of unmasking is much more complicated. Comic anagnoresis, the recognition scene of, of classical comedy, is, is just in time recognition, being saved by the bell, being saved at the last moment. The comedy of errors is rectified at, um, at zero hour. Everybody gets married and things work out. Mm -hmm. Farcical unmasking is potentially unending 
The nephew does not simply drop the iron mask to reveal his own face. The hideous face behind the iron mask is itself already a mask. The, the, this is what <coughs> distinguishes me, and, 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 and is, is itself produced um, and created by the obscure, the obscure because obscured or occluded class relations that have, um, that have made this, this apparition possible. This is what distinguishes Bonaparte and sausages, this, this kind of conjunction, from the well-rehearsed um, infinite judgments along the lines of world soul on horseback or spirit is a bone. Um, I, guess I'll, I guess I will stop now. <laughs> Thank okay. you. So great, we now have um, time for um, discussion, questions. Oh, and, and um, would you mind standing up so they can hear you in the back? Yes, I don't have the mic, so uh, I will speak up. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful panel. What, what, what a great panel to close the first day. Um, I think I have a couple of uh, comments, um, for, uh, one for Katie and the other for Miguel. Um, I'm still digesting Rebecca's presentation, so, uh, um, don't take it personally. <laughs> so I was wondering, um, I really appreciate y'all, uh, your sort of take on Lazarus and sort of your adoption of the figure and sort of working through that parable. Um, but by the end of your presentation, I started wondering whether a better figure for the surplus population actually is not Lazarus, but ever. <laughs> And not the real Abraham, but the uh, surplus Abraham mm -hmm. of the Kafkian parable, mm -hmm. uh, of, of Kafka's parable, where we have not just the real Abraham, but also surplus Abrahams who, show, who haven't been called upon, but, but show up anyway. And that's the figure um, uh, of a mis misinterpolated subject. Mm -hmm. okay, so the subject who hasn't been called upon, but shows up anyway. And for me, Lazarus is a, is a figure for an interpolated subject, as, as you, you, you saw through my... So I wonder, you know, um, so for me, sort of surplus population are anti-Lazarus. Misinterpolate. Nobody calls upon them, but the revolutionaries don't call upon them, but they show up and um, something changes. Um, for uh, Kitty, I, I, really, I really appreciate sort of the, uh, the paradise um, metaphor. Again, we have sort of Christian... Um, theme here, and it reminded me. I was wondering if you uh, would like to consider. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, pair uh, story by Clive Lewis, uh, which is called The Great Divorce. It's a story that you might want to revisit. It's about sort of the, hell, the, the great divorce between heaven and hell, and basically, hell is just a sort of capitalist and familiar universe, suburban, sprawling suburbs where everybody kind of mm. argues and gossips. And uh, there are tours, the bus tours that take visitors to to paradise. Mm -hmm. So what what I find interesting there that every visitor kind of arrives there and doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of when I read this parable, it reminded me of sort of foreigners visiting the Soviet Union and not getting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so but every um, so every visitor is assigned uh, a consciousness raising guide in the story. So kind of, uh, I thought you might be able to work it into your argument. Mm -hmm. So kind of kind of trying to raise the consciousness to this universality state that you're describing, so the visitor would acquiesce to staying or would be, you know, would be fit enough on the consciousness level to, uh, you know, adopting mm -hmm. paradise. Thank you. Yeah. Lorenzo. Um, yes, I have a question uh, for Gal, and actually, hopefully, like, uh, I give you a chance to say something about Lenny. Mm -hmm. uh, good, good. I would like to hear how the sequence uh, proceeded because I would personally excite, uh, expect a, a sheer opposition between Marx and Lenin on the question of the Lazarus uh, Bloomberg proletariat. Mm. And uh, my question, and I, I'm really curious to hear, so it's a question about what I would expect to yeah. right? My question would be would you say that, the, at least in English, the term for Lazarus in in Lenin is toiler, the toiler, the hard laborer, mm. who is not, definitely not the proletariat. And in this regard, I think it's in um, one of the last uh, speeches uh, Lenin gave, I mean, at one point Lenin says, I know here, I'm paraphrasing closely, I know here, it's a text of uh, 1921, 22, I think, uh, I know here I'm going against um, Marx, but we should change proletariat 
proletarians of the world unite with tollers of the world unite. And in the same text, he actually speaks, and this links, I think, with your point on surplus population, which becomes something good for them. In the same text, he speaks about the fact that uh, seven uh, tenth of the world population, so a biopolitical dimension, uh, are toilers, and he says, like, this is like a bright future for, and he spells out, he singles out Russia, China, and India. Let's take these two. Yeah, well, to start. Um, um, yeah, well, uh, it's a good point uh, about the capitalist subject uh, all, of, all of a sudden finding oneself in this already um, space where uh, the contradictions are resolved and some kind of pleroma achieved. But this is exactly um, the case that... Um, uh, what I wanted to claim that uh, the issue is about uh, uh, ourselves being the capitalist subjects, uh, 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 simultaneously with claiming the communist idea. So uh, rather than uh, um, placing ourselves as the subject of emancipation, uh, to what extent ourselves uh, is... Um, uh, this incapacity to, uh, to find one, oh, one, oneself in these um, de-alienated de conditions. Because, uh, I mean, getting rid of uh, capitalist con consciousness and, well, I could proliferate um, further uh, uh, the realms of libidinality, the, the realms of lack <coughs> and desire, something that is constructing the contemporary capitalist subject makes it unimaginable to... To, to claim um, um, certain types of, of politics and certain types of common good. And we might think that we are ready for that, and we might think that we uh, have application for, for these um, uh, elements of common good, but uh, it might not um, uh, be the case. And uh, uh, actually, Agamben has a very interesting... Uh, uh, notion of Oriol in his *Die Kommende Gemeinde*, uh, the coming community. Uh, it's called Oriol, uh, and he's saying that uh, uh, you you might have the same uh, same material uh, construction. I mean, imagine you have the same room, but in uh, without the Oriol, everything is in drawbacks and everything is in lack. But when the Oriol is there, it is it is a little insufficient addition, but addition of what you cannot get, but everything gets into pleromatic abundance. So um, I, would, uh, I would suggest that this insufficient socialism uh, with its uh, mutated drawbacks is, is this condition of um, premature uh, uh, situation when pleroma is there and it makes the still capitalist subject absolutely uh, dispersed and uh, quite schizophrenic. Yeah. Thanks for both uh, comments, questions. Um, I think about the, the first, uh, Abraham, um, in very interesting suggestion. I haven't thought about it. Maybe I should explore it a little bit further. But perhaps what I didn't stress uh, so much was that, yes, Lazarus maybe was uh, successful, but not interpolation, but counter-interpolation. He responded, of course, to, to God's help and the awakening. But I try to stress that in a kind of structure of the society or the morality against all the odds of your nature, it kind of there is this kind of leap of faith or let's call it a certain kind of he's there a tri trigger just kind of carrier of a revolutionary movement so in this sense there is much more ambivalent take it's just like stressing okay he does as the god kind of commands there is uh, let, let, you want to let it yeah, 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 sorry yeah no no but you can go uh, uh, then, I, I remembered uh, in connection with Lazarus and in connection with your question uh, there is an Italian director, Romeo Castellucci, who made a play on Lazarus and 
uh, his interpretation, he's a big, um, well, he struggles with Catholicism and of course he has this, uh, some sacrilegious um, performances with Catholicism, with the image of Christ, etc., and with the gospel generally. And uh, his encounter between Christ and Lazarus um, is that um, uh, Lazarus is claiming that he's for death and he has to die so that Christ is claimed as the mortal. And then the whole mm. performance is how Christ is not able to resurrect and Christ mm. is dying. So I would say that this is the, this is the case. I don't want paradise. We, we just uh, fuck your paradise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just like a very short... Um, about this, like the trigger revolutionary movement, there is a kind of for me, importance in this shift in within Althusserian frame, so kind of to account for a certain miss kind of interpretation or miss interpolation, if you want to say, also in terms of Mladen Dolar and this kind of that important text contribution beyond interpolation, so kind of how to account for something like that. And the other part is like kind of connection between Althusser and Gramsci. So kind of this counter-hegemonic struggle within kind of the enemy field or ideological field. So this is where I found like kind of Lazarus, uh, Lazarus figure interesting. Um, then maybe for the Marx and Lenin, I would completely agree with you um, that there is a big gap between maybe not so much the early kind of Lenin. There you can find still a very, uh, let's say, loyal uh, line of this old manifesto, Old Testament communist manifesto, German social democracy. Lenin was a kind of loyal believer. But I would put a kind of first political break already in 1914. A kind of, he thought that basically it's a kind of Russian spies mm -hmm. that are telling the stories about the German social democracy that is voting for the credits. And there is a certain kind of um, disappointment, of course, political disappointment, but also theoretical disbelief in this kind of industrialization that will kind of save us or kind of like kind of make the primacy of economy over the politics. It's like where we can expect that the political subject or kind of the, the, the event will take place. So it's like that's, that's maybe one, one side that between 1914 and then 17, and also like what you were quoting in what way he was kind of rectifying certain political slogans and so on. So like that's, that's maybe um, one thing. The, the other one, um, I mean, my kind of criticism of Marx uh, was that he took surplus population only from the standpoint of capital. So not dialectically, like what he usually does when he goes through all sorts of moments and historical processes. In this, he, be, he stays on a very negative side of the phenomena of politics. While the other side, the Fanon, that's why I kind of encountered him with Fanon, he's just like optimization or kind of optimist moment of, of the lumpen proletariat, right? So it's like, that's, that's a little bit in between those kind of political positions I see Lenin kind of as uh, infusing the kind of revolutionary dynamic, talking about the revolutionary organizations. And this is the interesting stuff. Uh, about Stodelet and uh, what is to be done. At the very end, he says, we have to dream. But in next couple of sentences, he comes with the list of organizational tasks. Mm -hmm. How to kind of make a political newspaper in Russia, how to do with all, deal with all political organizations and so on. So it's a beautiful thing, like the most kind of dreamy part of kind of imagining the other world, constructive, kind of constructivist, futurist poetry, like what you were saying about the deed and the word, and then on the other side, a very precise organizational pressing task that are there. That's kind of the beauty of, of Lenin, probably. Um, and my question, maybe also then uh, for you, would be how you would see with, because you mentioned resurrection and kind of uh, Lazarus's tragedy, Jesus's farce, and the general uh, resurrection of humanity coming of the machines. I don't know. Aaron. 
I just have a brief comment for um, Rebecca. It's that, you know, as far as I know, Marx has two discussions of this relation between comedy and tragedy. So not just the Rumer, but earlier in that, um, mm. in the mm. contributions yeah. of the critique of okay, Hegel's philosophy of right. And I think there, he has a formulation that's, that fits your picture like perfectly well. I mean, there he has the idea, I mean, to summarize it, tragedy is when the dialectical machinery is working. So tragedy is basically an old social form. Uh, will be surpassed and will die because it's not able to reproduce itself in the new conditions. So tragedy is like the death of an old form. Comedy happens when an old form has died, but somehow it doesn't know it's dead, so it's still hanging around. And comedy mm. deals mm. with then the afterlife mm. of these dead forms. Uh. And comedy is meant to be the kind of cheerful solvent, mm. like a kind of last farewell. I mean, True. Marx's example is like, the gods die in Aeschylus' tragedies, and then they die a second death in Lucian's really satires. Cool. And I would just, just to finish, I mean, my thought is, what would happen if this comic moment itself misfired? So that there's a kind of afterlife of a dead form, but comedy itself isn't potent enough or isn't able to dismiss this dead form, so we end up in a kind of eternally recurring comic, or eternally recurring farce, with this gesture of a last goodbye endlessly is repeated. Mm. This would, I think, correspond to what we call a dialectical stasis. You. Marina? Uh, thank you. Um, Loud? Thank yeah. for uh, all your presentations. I have two questions. One is for Rebecca, and the other one is for Katie. Uh, so I'll start with um, the question for Rebecca. Uh, if revolution is art, does it necessarily exclude uh, the science of revolution? And by science of revolution, I understand two things. First is that revolution itself can be seen as a certain examination, a process of examination of reality, uh, a process of questioning reality in search for truth. And second is that revolution has its own, um, demands its own uh, scientific needs, such as strategy, mm -hmm. tactics, etc. Uh, and the question for Ketty is mainly about the political implications of the paradise metaphor. If we are already in communism, uh, how can we become a communist subject? And this is the question, the question which has been bothering me uh, for years as well. If the communism is already there, uh, what does it mean for us? What is to be done? Uh, does it mean uh, that we have to make a special physical, intellectual, or ethical effort? Or does it mean that we have to question uh, reality and, the, and our environment? Or does it probably mean that we have to put uh, special glasses that enable us to see clearly. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. okay. whoever wants to. Um, yeah, thank you for both those questions. Um, I just the the brief response to to Aaron um, that that so. Aaron is referring to the 1843 preface to the introduction to the critique of Hegel's philosophy, right? Where Marx makes this astonishing point, and he's here talking. He's it's 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 kind of the, the, there's a symmetry and there's a profound asymmetry between the non-revolution that he's lamenting in 1843 Germany and the defeated revolution that he's puzzling in 1848. 1851 France. And the difference is basically that, I mean, in the, why he can still speak of a comedy in 1843, and I think has to speak of a, very savagely of a farce in, you know, 1853 or whenever he writes his text, um, has to do with the fact, the, the, the great difference between um, the Germany that he's portraying is a Germany which can't have its he's still committed to stages. It can't have its, its mm. revolution because it, it, it hasn't yet caught up to the, it hasn't yet caught up to the, you know, to the French of 1789. It's, it's at, the bourgeoisie has not even become a revolutionary class. So he says it suffers the, what's, what's creepy about Germany 
is that it suffers the defeat. It suffers. It's it's the only country that's able to suffer restoration without having its own reformation. Mm-hmm. It it suffers the defeats of the of the of the revolution without having actually had its revolution. So it's it's purely it's kind of a primordial counter revolutionary situation without a revolution having preceded this counter revolution. So it's the German. Um, it's that that's that's the kind of ghostly condition of, of Germany in, in 1843. And it becomes a, a comedy. Um, I, think, I, I think that's a, the, a real deus ex machina, actually. I mean, when he, when he invokes the kind of satire play and the, the kind of letting the almost Nietzschean trope of, of, of comedy as a letting, uh, an ability to let go of the past. Whereas the farce of the 18th Brumaire um, is the opposite, a situation where the bourgeoisie, in contrast to France, where the bourgeoisie had not yet become a proper bourgeoisie, in France, the bourgeoisie has somehow lived itself. So we have, it's, it, it, it lives, it's, it's the comedy of the, it's the farce of the undead rather than the, um, this, this, you're shaking shake, shake your head there. <laughs> um, the bourgeoisie is, is, is superannuated in France, um, which means it's 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 kind of clinging on, um, as does the state, which functions in this vampiric state. So I'm not I'm not sure. So, so and that's why the farce seems to be unending in a way that the comedy is not. Um, the second the second question about science and art, um, I think would would um, pertain to the, the really cognitive. I mean, no, there is no hard and fast distinction. And this pertains, I think, to the, the cognitive work that, uh, that, that, that art is doing in, under revolutionary conditions. And that's why um, the, the, you know, some kind of modified Aristotelian framework um, is, is pertinent here, some kind of dia noia um, that is at work in the, that is occasioned by the, the making, which is the revolution, which, in which case science and Art um, as as different kinds of techne technide become this distinction becomes not so relevant. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Marina, for this question. Actually, very appropriate question. Um, if you look uh, at, at the images and um, some kind of heroes uh, of 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 this Soviet self censorship of how to fit the communism they are all in a certain way martyrs so it starts with martyrdom and it's much more a martyr than some kind of transgressive um, subversive uh, subjectivity and that's why uh, when we had this um, uh, emancipation emancipatory traditions coming from the 60s, uh, they were um, all the time blaming, where is your subversion? Where is your deviation? Uh, but here I'm, I'm talking about uh, converse topography, converse topology. So uh, we, um, w- w- in the context of, of 60s, we are understanding revolutionary anthropology and anthropoplastics and anthropochoreography as some kind of um, transgressive element of violation, deviation, uh, uh, and resistance is um, uh, using these these languages. Whereas, um, uh, uh, if if you look at that, well, 1917 has brought a seizure of capitalism. I mean, let's logically uh, agree about this. Like Christ came and gave everyone uh, immortality. It was 2,000 years ago. So what? I mean. Uh, it, it never ended to, it never ended, you know, repentance, oh, I'm, but it, it never happened. So, uh, therefore, this anthropoplastic or, or anthropochoreography is rather reaching uh, the, already, uh, the already common. So, because communism is not about some profession to be communist, it's common good. It's about common good. It's, it's about comprising uh, that you have what you have. So it's, uh, it's the satisfaction with the pleromatic. And when the pleromatic is, is the, even insufficient is pleromatic. So it's a very um, specific uh, condition of um, maybe seizure of, of, of desire and of libidinality, but it's a long talk. Okay. 
um, yeah, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna follow the lead from the previous one and, and have people who haven't. Okay, so okay, they are just asking all my questions. So. Okay, good. <laughs> so so uh, yeah. you're next. Um, I was interested in the juxtaposition between uh, your your talk of stoicism and of Christianity. You know, if you see that stoicism is the kind of reigning philosophy of the enlightened middle class. Again, um, again. Yeah, I mean, you, you say you say that stoicism is the the kind of enlightened m middle class philosophy. Now, if we take the way that stoicism was interpreted by Hadot or Foucault, the, the kind of telos of stoicism is an autarkic, autonomous self, yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's underpinned by certain kind of self-practices and spiritual practices. So if we can say, if we can interpret, if that's kind of reigning ideas of the, the middle class, we can look at kind of their meditation or their obsessive yoga or their jogging <laughs> as kind of the rituals and spiritual practices that, under, that underpin this stoicism. So I'm wondering, is, is it those kind of stoic, cynical practices that actually foreclose the ability for that interpretive call, that kind of bringing, bringing out with, coming forth like Lazarus, that kind of, uh, you know, interpolation, is it, is it these kind of rituals that foreclose that? And if so, what kind of rituals can we think of that might, um, you know, disrupt that? Angela? Um. I'm kind of trapped here. But, uh, yeah, can you uh, yeah, try to stand up and, and speak out so everyone can hear you even in the uh, back? Okay, I have a question for Rebecca and one for Kent as well. Um, it's a very uh, kind of repetition of uh, the cycle of tragedy and farce and tragedy appearing retrospectively through its farcical repetition mm -hmm. is described in the very temporality of capitalism. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if this is what you imply. Yeah. Was it in, in the 18th Lumiere? Right, we have the famous, again, biblical phrase, let the dead bury the dead, let the revolution take its own contents, that goes beyond the phrase, and so on. Um, my question is, is there tragedy after the victory of the revolution? Because, um, I mean, uh, in the Soviet Union, at least in the 30s, uh, what was instituted is kind of an expelling of a tragedy uh, temporally to the past, locating it in the past, Mm -hmm. uh, and also especially outside of the uh, mm -hmm. Soviet sphere. Uh, maybe I might be wrong, but perhaps Katy could correct me if I am. And um, so that's the question for Rebecca and for Katy. I'm wondering uh, what are the political implications of um, uh, your statement that the, 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 the global divide today is between mm -hmm. those who know and those who don't know yet resent those who know. Because on the one hand, we have kind of propagation of ignorance, right? Yes. Um, and on the other hand, we have sort of false democratization of knowledge yes. uh, by the very ideology of neoliberalism, you know, through equity, uh, equal access, and all kinds of, you know, uh, actions that are implied within the technologies that produce knowledge as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, um, I don't know how would Rebecca answer this question about tragedy, but, well, what I experienced, maybe my experience is false, because I'm all the time uh, told that, well, experience is not the grounds to, um, to motivate your uh, analytics. But nevertheless, I would say that uh, I, I think that tragedy was not expelled. I think, on the contrary, um, what you see in cultural production of the Soviets that every administrative trifle is becoming the tragedy of consciousness and self-consciousness, is becoming the tragedy of honesty and of judgment. And this judgment, uh, how, uh, as Benjamin says, how tragedy was emerged. It's a um, trial. And the trial is the main paradigm of uh, of Soviet filmography, theater, uh, 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 some kind of, um, well, private individual comes and says, I was uh, an asshole. Now I'm becoming the uh, uh, speculative general subject. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and then the whole story becomes the story of his tragic biography. So, actually, uh, I, uh, you, you have nothing but this uh, tragic, uh, self-trial uh, all the time. 
Um, so I would say that tragedy is not is not expelled. Mm. Mm. Concerning um, uh, another question, uh, uh, what are the political implications about knowledge and non-knowledge? Well, uh, I I, uh, I deal with a lot of practices who are. Uh, claiming uh, cognitive excellences as some kind of transposition and hybridization of the political sphere. So um, uh, uh, they are uh, somehow uh, transposing a knowledge uh, uh, from the condition of the, of, of the commons in terms of... Um, I mean, uh, th there is a very famous uh, dialogue, oh, sorry, it's not Fido, but... Uh, it's Plato's dialogue, I forgot, sorry, it's sclerosis. Uh, but um, uh, uh, there Socrates is saying that, um, I mean, knowledge is not about cognitive issue, knowledge is about virtue. So, again, you, you have this element of common good, so to what extent cognitive element is mind, uh, and to what extent mind is able uh, to somehow um, not go into this Faustian acceleration of techno-cognitive uh, excellence, but um, remain within the commons. It's a big question since the 70s. So, I mean, it, 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 it will remain uh, as long as we are discussing everything up to artificial intelligence and all those kinds of excellences. Where is mind and where is intelligence? And you didn't answer. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great <laughs> question. I'm still, catching, I'm still trying to catch up with that, because yeah. um, the, the question that I think the 18th Vermeer deposits on our doorstep and capital takes up is, can there be a, can there be a revolution once, um, you know, once one gives up, as the 18th Vermeer seems to be on the way to doing, and capital seems to be actually doing, gives up the, um, any clear polarity of class antagonisms, and thus the, 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 the tragic model of revolution becomes very problematic. Um, um, so if capital becomes the, the agent, um, and capital itself is, is, you know, there's a certain resemblance with the tragic hero. It, it has its, you know, its fatal ignorance. It keeps on falling, and yet comically keeps on Rebounding, so it's it's kind of the farcization, if you like, of, of tragedy in, in the making without without any kind of learning. It's this constant cyclical um, reversal and so on and so forth. So um, that's kind of as far as I've gotten. Actually, what is the genre of of capital itself? I mean, I believe Trotsky in Literature and Revolution once said, "We will we will in the future have tragedies without fate." I mean, if you can, if you can have that category, um, but I, I just, I, I actually don't know what it means in the context of post, uh, com, uh, post capitalist society. Um, was there... Yeah, um, Artemy. Yeah. Uh, question to Rebecca. Well, Aaron asked the first half of my question, uh, but uh, I will just continue. So. Stand so they can hear you too, so okay. you don't have your back to. So, um, in fact, it's in the uh, preface to the criti uh, critique of Hegel's philosophy of right that uh, uh, Marx actually makes the point that uh, uh, the German Revolution fights against uh, the regime that is already dead, mm -hmm. right? So you you have to kill what has already been killed once, and what do you do? The answer is violence. So for him, laughter is, uh, he says, uh, uh, what you laugh at uh, um, uh, will not die because you laugh. You have to kill it with your knife. Mm. Uh, so it's actually the text that is uh, an early text that is very explicit about the need of violence, which is connected to some kind of symbolic activity, which is comic, but it's, again, it's not simply uh, laughter. Some, uh, uh, laughter is part of it. Uh, I, I'll, right, but that yeah. still suggests that still suggests that one can actually kill it off, violently or, or non-violently. Well, still you have to try. Kind of end. You have to try. Yeah. So basically, laughter is negativity for Marx. Yeah. It's radical negativity. Uh, while uh, in the 18th of Brumaire, it's the same idea, but he also adds that uh, the, um, the uh, unlike the bourgeois revolution, the proletarian revolution 
it uh, um, draws its poetry from the future and stumbles. It goes back and uh, returns. It goes back and returns. So that's okay. You can say it's comic too, but it's something else. Uh, it's more uh, the poetry of this very slow development. I would say like something like a novel, uh, where you progress very gradually uh, and through self-criticism. Uh, uh, and this, in this way, you overcome, again, the, the task is the same. You overcome the uh, a tragic, like, quick model of bourgeois revolution. <laughs> now, the question is, uh, what's, what's your political message? Like, uh, because, uh, uh, in fact, to say that the revolutions have, um, uh, you know, they, they, they are comic, they, they happen formulaically, but that's exactly what's happening. We have a revolution every month, uh, and it's really funny. Uh, so it's it's dangerous to say that okay, revolutions are now funny because that's exactly what's go what's happening. I, I think that the solution would be to really to continue or to develop your argument uh, to have to make um, finer distinctions between modes of the comic. There is comedy, and there is uh, uh, comedy as a form of play in a theater. And there is what Bakhtin called carnival, which is laughter under the open air, and uh, where there is a subject, which is the people. That's very important, because uh, Aristophanes has some, some of it, but of course, comedy, in the literal sense of the word, uh, it's the actors who play it. There is the actors, the public. Here, there is the uh, mm. leap mm. under the open sky of history, as Benjamin said. That's the model of comic that would be more suggestive. Can I just add a small little thing to that? Because we'll go to Rebecca, too. Just very small, very small. Uh, and tell me if I'm wrong. I see the, the part I loved best about your talk, and it was really terrific, was um, Lenin on slogans. And revolution as an art form, and Lenin describing how that art form is constructed and why slogans are absolutely necessary. <coughs> I marked down here: uh, uh, slogans make history by marking it, uh, condensing telling into an action. So I saw that as a totally other aesthetics from getting caught in comedy, tragedy, blah blah. But that was just my way of adding on to your question. Right. Well, I think the. Oh. Okay, why don't we let, go ahead and let Re, um, Rebecca finish, and then we will call it a night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Rebecca. <laughs> but people I'm excited. <laughs> um, um, so, I think the tricky thing about, about the slogan and, and why Lenin is so subtle is that there's no formal way of distinguishing a, 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 a no formal way of distinguishing a slogan from from any other codified speech um, so that's re repetitive, um, habitual, and so on, which is, which is partly why they have to keep changing, because history is not static. It's not, not changing because of the need for novelty. They're changing because, actually, the, the, the formulas no longer work, as opposed to the language of advertising, where the formulas either stay the same, Coke is the real thing, as you showed us, um, or they keep adapting, which is, which is a very different kind of change. Um, so, but I don't see it as a completely different art form, and I'm frankly quite skeptical of the, of the poetry of, of the future, um, which Marx doesn't, can't really project and, and doesn't try to um, project. It's notable, it's, to me it's notable that he, there is no, there, he, it's a, it's a, it's a discourse searching for its genre, if you like, which is why, you know, when he, 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 you know, when he describes the proletariat slaughtered on the streets of Paris um, in, in, a, in roughly contemporary um, reportage that he's doing, um, he, he has no language other than something that sounds like melodrama or something like that. He just like there, he's much more articulate about, um, he's much more articulate about the bourgeoisie than he is about, and, and the kind of pitfalls of the, you know, the, the escapades of the bourgeoisie, than he is about the suffering of the um, proletariat. For, and and that's, that, 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 that reticence, it seems to me, he's already 
um, explained the, the need for which uh, reticence he's already explained completely, and it's it's not dissimilar to his reticence about about providing recipes for the cook shops of the future. That's safe of, of describing communism. No more can he describe communism than he can describe what an art form, you know, what what what, what kind of genre would be. This actually gets to your question too, I guess, would be appropriate to uh, communism. So the problem, I mean, I mean. Yeah. The, Feeling. Forget about poetry. It's feeling. Mm. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Many well, words. Eisenstein, of course, did not shirk from um, describing Potemkin very, you know, very systematically as, as a tragedy with its, you know, at, at a yeah, formal and effective level, right? Yeah. But that's still not the poetry of the future. Alright. Thank you, everybody. I am on the work. <laughs>